Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are happy to have you this afternoon as we uh, prepare to have a great career chat with another awesome person who is not here in Palm Beach County. Um, he's actually in Europe as well, like our last speaker in Italy. So um, my name is John Shoemaker from the Department of Educational Technology. And today we're going to be talking to Yaniv, and he is the global business lead for Zipline. And before we get started, just keep in mind that there is a chat over on the right-hand side. Please make sure you use appropriate chatting. This is an official district uh, uh, sponsored event, so please be use appropriate language. Also, make sure you're not using too many capital letters or uh, emojis or symbols or anything like that, or it will it'll automatically put you in timeout for a little bit. So um, the whole chat point, the whole point of the chat is for you to ask questions to Yaniv um, and learn more about what his job is and how you could maybe follow in his footsteps uh, and be totally innovative. So with that, I am going to introduce my colleague again, Kaylin Markman. She's from the curriculum team in secondary science, and uh, she'll get everything started. So take it away, Kaylin. Thank you, John. Um, for everyone who's logged in this afternoon, you are in for quite a unique journey. Uh, my dear childhood friend, Yannick Gelnick, is here, all the way from France, uh, to talk about his role in an amazing company called Zipline. Thank you so much for being here today, Yannick. I really appreciate that. Um, so to get us started, I'd love to ask you, uh, I'm curious, um, if you were going to write an autobiography, what would the title be? And you're, you're muted in case, in case you didn't realize. Hey. There you go. Um, I mean, it, I, I thought about your question before. I think, um, I mean, anarchy. There's absolutely no order to uh, what I've ever done. There's been no connection from one job to the next. Um, so yeah, I would, I would have, definitely, the word anarchy would be in there. Um, but I think that if I think about kind of what's really driven my career direction and career choices, it's always really just focused on, does this seem interesting and is it with cool people? And, you know, that's that's taken me to all kinds of different jobs from farming, construction. I was a waiter for a long time and now I run business development for uh, for this drone company. So I've really just oriented myself around trying to do cool stuff with cool people and that, that's it. Wherever that takes me, it takes me. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Yanine. So normally we might go in some sort of chronological order, but rather than doing that, and before we kind of showcase the technology, um, I know your company right now is doing some amazing work with regard to COVID, and that's, that's obviously at the forefront. So why don't we talk with a bit with the kids about um, what kind of impact are you guys making right now? Sure. Um, well, Zipline is a drone logistics company. That means that we do drone deliveries. Um, just like uh, if you've ever thought about you know, science fiction and in the future where a drone is moving things around. And so we're the only company in the world that actually does that. And so um, when COVID came up, we saw that the countries that we operate in actually had some specific challenges that we could fix with our drones. I'll give you some examples. Um, one example is you know, when health systems, if you're thinking of yourself as the minister of health of a country, you're responsible for everybody being healthy. Um, but now this is a brand new situation that nobody could be prepared for. Uh, I mean, in the U.S., of course, uh, as everybody knows, there's been really a lack of gloves, of personal protective equipment, things like that. Well, if you buy a bunch of those masks, where are you going to send them? You don't really know where the next flare up is going to be. Where are people going to be sick? So today, what you would have to do is you'd have to take a guess and say, well, I'll put some, 100 of them in Miami, and I'll put some over there in, in Boca, and, and, and hopefully it's enough for, for a while. But with our company, what they've done is they've given everything to us. And then the minute that a doctor needs something, that doctor will send us an SMS or WhatsApp, give us a call, and in about 15 minutes, they'll have whatever they need, regardless of where they are. So you no longer have to guess where it's going to be needed. And when the vaccine is finally available, that's really important because everybody's going to want this vaccine and they're not really going to know where to send it. Also, they're going to have to make sure that it's kept in like really tight uh, refrigeration because they don't want it to go bad on the way, which happens all the time, especially in hot climates like where you live. But if they give it to us, we can guarantee that it's protected and we can send it so fast in our super fast drones that when it gets there, it's still cold and it'll work. Um, another good example of how we're being used for uh, coronavirus is 
there's certain parts of certain countries that don't have coronavirus yet. And so, of course, the first thing they do is they shut off access to that area. They'll say nobody can go to this town because we don't want the, uh, the, the, the virus. We don't, we don't want the people there to be exposed to the virus. So we just use our drones to do all the deliveries, whatever they need. They get by drone now. And so those people have been protected and, every, and the countries can wait before exposing them so they can be prepared to have enough hospital beds, for example, enough PPE to treat those people when they get sick. So the countries we work in have really been able to manage the coronavirus crisis in a way that much more developed countries like the U.S. Uh, have not been able to because of this cool technology. That's really, really cool. Um, and, and now, so I want to show them, actually, and, and we'll showcase how they actually work. So here's a package, right, being delivered. But let's go ahead and I'm going to show them a video that um, you could probably speak about, you know, um, and what's happening in this video so that they can see how does it actually work. Yeah, um, cool. Yeah. Okay, so this is our launcher. That's our fixed wing drone. It's not one of those toy quadcopter drones. It looks more like a little airplane. You can see we fly in the rain, we fly in all weather. That's really important because we want people to be able to rely on us on, on when it's bad weather. And we deliver with a parachute. We don't ever land. And that's really important too because, well, I'll get to that why that's important. So we operate from distribution centers just like this. I mean, it's all, it looks complicated, but it's not. One of those rooms has a bunch of refrigerators and the other one has a bunch of drones that we make ourselves. When somebody calls us up, we take the stuff out of the refrigerator and put it in the drone. So our first facility was built about four years ago in a country called Rwanda in the middle of Africa, in East Africa, really. Uh, and after they used us for a while, they loved it so much, they asked for a second one. And so now we cover that entire country. So that is the first country in the world to have national scale drone logistics. Anything anybody needs, they can get in 15 minutes. And then in Ghana, that's the other country on the right that we've just launched in a year ago, and we're covering about 12 million people there. So how does it work? The health workers in their facility, they give us a call, an SMS, or WhatsApp, what have you. They let us know what they need. We have pharmacists and nurses that are taking care of all the medicine, all the blood products, whatever it is. We, we, we handle it very carefully, and you know, we, especially with rare blood products. I mean, some blood products like platelets only have a five day shelf life, meaning five days after you take it from the person who donated the blood, it, you can't work anymore. So we keep it there under the very strict um, conditions, storage conditions. We put it in this special box and we hand it to the flight operations team. Now the flight operators will then take that box with the medicine, blood, and even if it has to be you know, maintained at a particular temperature, the packaging is designed to make sure that the stuff will really be taken care of on the way. We put it in the drone. We have our team do the pre-flight inspection, as you can see here. Then we let the Civil Aviation Authority know that we're coming. You know, obviously there's a lot of airplanes in the sky and we don't want to hit them. So we are, we're very well coordinated with them. We built this cool system that you can see here. So you can actually watch the drones in real time. So everybody who has this, you know, this monitor, this iPad can see where the drones are, see what they're doing. And if there's ever an emergency, they can let us know that we've got to take action. For example, we can tell the drone to come home. Uh, if, if there's an emergency. And then the drone will fly all by itself. There's no pilot here. This is completely artificial intelligence driven. As the drone approaches the health facility, we let the health worker, the doctor or nurse know that the package is coming, it's two minutes away, and then we drop it with this parachute. And we always drop it in the exact same spot. It's super cool because the drone has to figure out what the wind conditions are exactly at that moment, and then drop the package. It might drop it over here, because it realizes, it calculated that the wind will carry it to the exact right spot. So it's a lot of engineering and intellectual property that we've had to develop to make that work. And then little baby can get his vaccine and everybody's happy. Then the drone flies itself home. And this is how we catch it. Watch this. Boom. We catch it in the middle of the, as, it, as it's flying by, uh, which is really complicated to do. But it's worth it because otherwise we would need runways, which take up a bunch of space. And also we would need landing gear, which is heavy. So by not having runways or landing gear, the drones can be much lighter and we can carry more stuff. So that's how it works. That is so cool. Thank you, Yaniv. Um, so a couple of questions come in from kids. Um, one was asking, uh, is Zipline going to spread to other countries? Yeah, that's my job. That's okay. exactly my job, so that's what I do. So usually I spend almost all of my time on the road um, going from country to country. Uh, uh, some, not, not that long ago, I, I, was in, I was in Kenya on Monday and Tuesday, 
Sri Lanka on Wednesday and Nigeria on Friday. And that is not that atypical for me because there's so many countries that are trying to figure out how to use our technology. Uh, and, and typically, you know, when we offer our, our service to a country, there's a lot of donors who want to help them get it. Um, and it's really about figuring out what are the specific problems in that country that we're going to try to help them solve, because every country is different. And I'm really happy to say that uh, even the U.S. Uh, now can benefit from our system, because just last week, actually just this week, on Monday, we got permission to fly in the U.S. And so we have uh, our first facility is being built right now in, or it's actually just been completed in North Carolina. Yeah, and I have an image of that, I believe. Um, yeah, or... Um, right here that you guys were in North Carolina, right? Um, so that, yeah, on the right, that's that's our plan for North Carolina. Um, but we, we've actually already started in one of those distribution centers. And we're doing two things there. You, we have one health system where it's a bunch of hospitals. And remember a minute ago, I mentioned platelets. Yeah. Platelets are really important, especially if you're bleeding a lot and, and you, need to, uh, you need the wound to heal. Um, so they have a hard time keeping platelets fresh in all the different hospitals. So they're just giving them to us and we'll just send them at the moment that they're needed. And that way, if something's about to expire, we could just send that one real fast before it does. So there's no more waste. So we're saving them a lot of money. But more importantly, there's a lot of people who have compromised immune systems, really sick people who shouldn't be leaving home, but they're chronic care patients. They need to get, it could be TB or HIV, or they could be diabetics and they need to get their medicine regularly. But with the virus going on, we don't want them to leave home because they'll get really sick. So we're actually delivering to people's homes. And that's, this is the first time that, uh, that we've been able to do that, but it's working. That is amazing. That is amazing. So um, one of the kids asked, do the drones ever malfunction? Well, we've done almost 40,000 of these deliveries and we've never had any kind of injury. We've never had a damaged product. What does happen sometimes is that the, uh, the air traffic controllers might call us up and they might say, you know, the president is flying through and so we need to clear the skies. Or sometimes a crazy person is in a helicopter. We don't know what he's doing. So we got to clear this area. And when that happens, you know, what we do is we launch our emergency parachute. The drone will gently land wherever it is. And we send out a team to go find it and bring it home. Um, but we've never had a situation where there's some kind of a malfunction and it crashes or something like that. It's never happened. Wow. So the technology is quite stellar. Um, yeah. what are you the technology is very tight. Say again? What power are you using to power them? It's all battery, completely electric. So we're not burning any fossil fuels. That was a really important part of, of, of our intervention, um, of our planning. We really wanted to make sure that it's very environmentally friendly. And a lot of the countries we operate in, like Rwanda, have very strict rules about how they protect the environment. You know, in Rwanda, you're not even allowed to have a plastic bag in the entire country. If you have a plastic bag in your suitcase when you show up there, you've got to sign a special form and show that bag when you leave or you'll get fined. So these are countries that are really thinking about their environment, and that's why they're, uh, they, we wanted to make sure that we're respecting that. Wow, that's amazing, that's amazing. So how many drones have you sent out so far? How many deliveries have you guys um, made thus far? About 40,000, just shy of 40,000. Yeah, that's how many deliveries we've done so far. We've delivered about 100, 000, a little more than 100,000 products, and about a third of those 40,000 deliveries were for a life-saving situation. Wow. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's really important, um, and I want to showcase this to the kids, um, you're talking about a lot of places that don't have paved roads, right? They don't have highway systems. So what Joseph's question here, asking what the top speed of the drone is really important because we're not talking about getting on 95 or the turnpike and being being able to take an ambulance in a straight run, right? You know, I think you could probably talk about that a bit. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you know, in some of these places, they don't have roads or they might have one really good road. Um, but, you know, you can get from one part of the country to another pretty well if there's no traffic, if there's no rain. But then once you get to that part of the country, you might have to go through some very tough roads. In fact, Ethiopia is a country I've spent a lot of time in this past year because they've really been interested in our system. And you've got situations where people are climbing up cliffs with a cooler on their back and the vaccines are in that cooler. And it, it's crazy because it's also a very poor country. And so if they brought too many vaccines with them, they have to go back down that cliff and bring them back because they can't let any vaccines get wasted. Or if they didn't bring enough, they've got to go back and do it again. And they've got to do that for each village that they want to treat. But now that we're going there, the health worker can just show up with nothing, 
count the exact number of kids they want to help, give us a call. 15 minutes later, whatever they need falls out of the sky. Then they can just go directly to the next village and give us another call. But it's amazing to think that I can just basically order a vaccine or blood with WhatsApp and be like, hey. <laughs> yeah, that's how it works. Exactly. I, did, I actually didn't answer that guy's question. I think it was Joe. Um, the drones can fly about, about 100 miles per hour. Wow. Okay. And remember, that's direct. That's not through 100 miles per hour through road. I mean, that is point to point. So we're really, really fast. That's fantastic. Um, so Gabriel is curious whether wind has ever caused a drone to go to the wrong place. Uh, no, actually, our, our drones are designed in a way, because we wanted to make sure that they can fly in all weather, they're designed in a way that even if there's like really, really heavy wind, the drones will have learned because of all the artificial intelligence how to correct for that. And if they're ever on a particular path and they get bumped by a particular you know, gust of wind, the drone will remember that so that next time it flies in that same spot, it'll speed up a little bit, it'll lean into the wind. Automatically, it'll figure out how to make sure to be prepared because that's a spot that, that sometimes has wind. So it's never, ever happened. Wind can't, and, and more than that, um, some of you might have heard of monsoons, which is a really tough weather condition that happens in India every year. So um, a giant state in India called Maharashtra with 120 million people just invited us to start flying there because during the monsoon season, they're not able to get the medicine to the people. And so our drones can fly even through a monsoon. And so we're going to be building two distribution centers there. That's amazing. Um, I want to pull up really quickly, just to orient them to a map, and then I'll go back to that question. Um, just so you guys are aware of what we're talking about here. So here we are, right, in South Florida. This is where Yaniv is right now, in France. Um, Yaniv is, uh, I don't know if you saw his bio, but he's Israeli-American. So that right there, that little spot right there, that's Israel. And he's, ta he's been talking about, um, and originally he was living in Kenya for a long time. And so here's Africa, right? And now he's talking about some places in India, just to orient you to a map and you have an idea of where we are with respect to him and the work that he's doing. Um, so another thing I wanted to show really quickly, and I think you need this will probably help them to see, is the drones actually lining up, right? Yeah. Um, see how intelligent that is um, and, and that at night. Um, so this is a great shot, and he could probably explain this better than I can. <laughs> So what's happening here is a bunch of drones have come home at the same time and they all want to land. So they're deciding between themselves who should really land first based on who's got the strongest battery. And then once the drone decides to come in, it determines the current wind conditions and it will decide if it's coming from the left or from the right. And then it will coordinate with this big guy. We call him Tall Bob. It'll coordinate with Tall Bob if it's coming from which direction it's coming from. And then Tall Bob will catch him. And it's really crazy how Tall Bob works because here you see how we launch, and that's what really allows us to fly in any weather, because we just go straight into it super fast. Uh, but when it comes home, it's got a one centimeter hook, like 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 less than a half an inch opening. The cable has to snap, these two sticks have a cable between them, right? And those two sticks have to calculate exactly where the drone is and how fast it's moving, so they can snap up at the right nanosecond, there's a rope between them, to catch that tiny little one centimeter hook so that the drone can kind of quickly be caught and slow down and then fall so that our team can grab it and put a new battery in and send it on another mission. Yeah, there you go, see? And it does this in the rain, in the wind, at night. Yeah, it just works. That's amazing, thank you for sharing that. The um, artificial intelligence part is really interesting too, I'll tell you why. Because when that drone comes in, let's say in Rwanda, and let's say we miss, it happens, the drone will go past and the little six will snap up and it'll miss. That's a great situation for us because what that means is that there's a new condition that we weren't prepared for. And so without us doing anything, the computers will say, all right, on a day with this kind of weather, this kind of wind, this kind of barometric pressure, and the drone is going at this speed, we miss. So we better maybe try to snap up a little bit earlier or a little bit later, and the, the system will keep trying, and the drone will just keep going around and around until the system catches it. Once the system catches it, we now know how to catch it in that weather. The next day in North Carolina, the same weather conditions could be happening, and we'll know exactly what to do because the system already saw it in Rwanda. So it's, it's global intelligence. That's fantastic. So it's like you're basically taking this variable 
that was a variable and controlling it so that you can, you know, have a better outcome. So that's fantastic. Um, so yeah. Arabelle is asking an interesting question, and this is kind of a question I wanted you to talk about a bit. Um, how long have you been doing this? But back it up a little bit for us and tell me about, um, like when you were a kid up until now, like what, co what, is, what career choices and what things have you done to get you to where you are now and how long have you been doing this? Um, well, I, I haven't really had a career uh, <laughs> like you have. Um, I, uh, I mean, I, I pretty much dropped out of high school. Uh, I went to the Israeli army. Uh, in Israel, you have to go to the army. And so I did that for a while. And then I was really lucky to get into a really good college in the US. Um, and that's when I really started thinking about having a job. Um, and and where, I just bounced around. Where did you go to college, you did? I went to Brown in Rhode Island, uh, where I met my wife. So that worked out really well. Um, and, uh, you know, since then, I mean, I haven't really had a particular career. I, um, I, I started a couple of companies with some friends and that went well. And, um, uh, I've, I've worked at a bu bunch of different companies, but there isn't really any kind of thread between them. And then I found myself living in Kenya where my wife is from and, um, and Zipline was growing in the region. And so that was two and a half years ago. They reached out to me and asked if I could help them, um, you know, uh, encourage other countries in the region, in the region to give it a shot. And so that's how I got involved. So I've been there for two and a half years now, and it's been a real adventure. So that really leads me to a great question before I go back to the chat window. Um, if you and I, because you haven't had one set career, right? So you've evolved over many, many years. Um, if you and I were gonna trade places today, what skills would I have to have to take on your job? You have all the skills that you would need to do my job. I mean, my, I don't know, I didn't know anything about drones when I got this job. I didn't know anything about artificial intelligence or even about healthcare. I mean, this, I didn't have any of this background. Um, but I love people and, uh, and I'm really passionate about it. And uh, I think that those are the two main things that have kind of been a common thread in the different jobs that I've had. You know, I'm not afraid to knock on doors. I'm not afraid to just walk into a conversation at a party and introduce myself. And, uh, and, and I think that that's a skill set that, that's, that's helped me and it's gotten me this job and it's, and it's helped me be successful at this job. Um, a lot of people, there's a lot of other companies trying to do this and we're the only company in the world. And I think that one of the, one of the reasons that our team has been successful is because we really do go and knock on those doors and say, hi, you don't know who I am and I don't have a, an appointment, but I'm gonna blow your mind right now with something crazy that I know how to do and that I think that you're gonna want us to do for you. And uh, and I don't, it doesn't feel like a sales job because it isn't about me trying to convince anybody of anything. It's much more about me sharing my passion um, and then trying to figure out with them, how do we make it happen? Um, yeah, so I think that you would do great at my job, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, think, I think so much of any career really is about relationship building, which you mentioned, and really having care for people. And I, I kind of want to pull this image up really quickly before we go over to the chat. And this is just a perfect example of while he may be working in a, a STEM field, right, where there is a ton of technology and science and math and engineering, um, it's about people. Um, and, and you could probably tell a brief story about this woman, Eve. Yeah, so uh, in a lot of the world, maternal mortality is a really big problem. Maternal mortality means uh, that mothers are dying while they're delivering a baby. And generally, the reason that happens um, in the U.S., you also have people who have uh, who are bleeding while they're making while they're delivering a baby. Um, and generally, if there's blood available and there's pitocin available, it's the medicine that you need. She's going to be fine. Um, but if it's not available, she, there's just no way to save her. And you just you know watch her die and watch the baby die, and it's awful. Um, in Rwanda, we were able to really reduce the amount of incidences of maternal mortality. Because whenever a mother is delivering a baby, even if there's no doctor in that village, if she's bleeding, the blood will show up and they will give her the blood and she will live. And so Alice was actually the first woman to receive um, a blood delivery by drone. As you can imagine, people freaked out. I mean, I would freak out if, you know, if I'm living in the middle of rural Rwanda and suddenly this flying robot shows up and drops, you know, exactly the right blood and medicine that she needs at the front door of the hospital. And next thing you know, she walks out with a baby. It's crazy. She was the first one to really experience that. And now we've got four hospitals in Rwanda 
that haven't had a single case of maternal mortality since we started working there. How wonderful is that? That is something to start to celebrate. Um, yeah, it's cool. Thank you for that story, Eve. Um, yeah. So I guess we're probably wondering, has, has a bird maybe <laughs> interfered with the no. Or yeah, it's a great round. <laughs> a great question. Um, it's never happened. Um, I think that it's because of the 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 the, the, the motors on our on our drone, the little uh, propellers, make a little bit of a buzzing noise, so they kind of let the birds know that they're coming. So no, we've never had a bird. Okay, that's a good. That's a good. Um, <laughs> how many are normally out at the same time? Well, it depends on the day, um, but. It could be, uh, you know, it could be any number. I mean, we could have 50 drones in the sky at, at, at one time, all being flown by an 18-year-old kid with an iPad. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, they're flying themselves, you know? There isn't much to do. Um, but we can have a lot out at the same time. And that's really important because imagine a mass casualty event. So there's a country called Sri Lanka that some of you might have heard of in South Asia, where I've spent a lot of time recently. And a year ago, in April 20th or 20, April 21st of last year, they had a terrible terrorist attack. Over 300 people were killed on Easter. Uh, and a lot of them were in churches, actually, um, uh, celebrating Easter. Um, and it was a really bad attack in the three major hospitals in the capital. It's called Colombo, ran out of a particular type of blood. And patients were showing up, and there was no blood to give them. And that's when they really called us, because they said, wow, if Zipline was here, you know, you could have taken all of your drones at the same time and have them fly that particular type of blood from all over the country right to the capital, and then these hospitals never would have run out of blood. Uh, so the ability to have a lot of these drones in the sky at the same time is really important when you have an emergency. That is, that is, that's a great point. Um, mm -hmm. There are definitely some other questions popping in. Um, package ever landed in the wrong spot? No, it's really, a, it's, it's, a, it's one of the marvels of technology that even on a super windy day, like I said before, I mean, sometimes the drone will release the package over here because it's calculated. It'll even pass the drop spot, depending on the wind, and drop the package and let the wind carry it back to its spot. It always lands in the exact right spot. And, and sometimes that'll be on the roof of a building. Sometimes that can be in the parking lot. Uh, we've never lost a product. That's Super impressive. Um, I don't. I don't think FedEx or UPS could say that. <laughs> not not backing any of them watching, but I don't think that they could say that. Um, right. So how how long does a drone battery usually last? Well, we make our own batteries, and so uh, whenever we need to kind of you know make new ones, we kind of disassemble them. Um, but you know, none of our technology has ever really reached its actual lifespan because. We make new drones and new batteries and new technology every six months or so. So before the drone is really ready to be retired, we've already replaced it with a newer model. Um, but each charge, if that's what you mean, uh, will last for about 170 kilometers. It's about, what is that, a bit like 100 miles, a little more than 100 miles. So our, our, our drone can fly up to 50 miles away, drop the package, and come back. Um, so that's how long each battery charge would last. I mean, that's very conservative. That's assuming that they're going against the wind in both directions and that they're climbing both directions, which is obviously impossible. Um, but we try to be really conservative with our estimates. So it's about a hundred miles round trip for each battery. Well, we all know that out of um, success, right, there's always struggle. So I'm sure the first time that uh, you te the, the company tested a drone, it didn't work that well, right? Um, because forward failure is what it's all about, right? Uh, we fail and we try again and try again and try again. So do you know how many times it took to perfect it? Oh yeah, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands. I mean, in the beginning, a lot of the drones that were designed by the team just I mean, didn't work at all. Um, but they kept trying, they kept trying, and in fact, when we launched in Rwanda on the first day and the president of Rwanda was there, um, our CEO took him aside and said, look, the system isn't really working and we think it's working, um, but all the press are here and we don't know what to do. And the president said, let's go in front of the press. We'll do our speeches. We'll hit the button and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, then we'll just point out that we're part of the innovation story. And it doesn't work right now because they're figuring it out and that's okay because that's how innovation works. And so our CEO was pretty nervous, but they did it and it actually did take off. And, uh, and it worked and everybody was really excited. But that's gotta be the attitude you take. It's just like I said before, when, those, when, when our tall Bob misses the drone, 
that is an opportunity for us. It's not a failure. Nobody at Zipline considers that a failure because we've just gotten a little bit smarter than we were five minutes ago. Absolutely. It's that old Henry Ford adage, right? That, you know, a failure is just an opportunity for, you know, another further excellence. It's, it's just an opportunity to take another chance at it, basically. And I mean, if we never failed, we would never change our system, right? Yeah, do it again more intelligently, right? So that's all. Yeah, every time we fail, it, it's like we get a little bit more ideas of like what we should be doing better. And that's what allows us to constantly make newer drones, better drones, and, uh, and, and solve even bigger and bigger problems. So, so the failure is part of the process. And what that just is a testament to is the idea of a strong work ethic and resilience and tenacity. And that's with any company, right? Or any career that you have um, to be successful. Um, True story. I think, I think it, it's really motivating to, 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 it's really hard. I'm not gonna pretend it's not hard. Um, but I think that if you, um, the two most important things, I mean, if you feel like, you know, you're, 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 if you're passionate about what you're doing and if you're surrounded by good people, then it's not hard to keep trying. Hi, <laughs> absolutely. So let me ask you then, um, you know, obviously to try means to take a risk. What would you say the, is the biggest risk that you've taken this? The biggest risk that I faced? That you've taken, right? So we know that obviously it takes, you have to take a risk, right? In order- In my job, in, yeah, in my job, I would say that the riskiest things that I have to do is sometimes I go to pretty dangerous places. Um, you know, there's certain countries that I have to visit um, and I'm the only one there and I've never been to that country and I don't speak the language and, um, and it's scary. I mean, it's scary to land in, in some of these places and I'm not even talking about like the capital of, of these countries. I'm talking about like the, the really remote areas where there's no rule of law in some cases, where there's no hospitals, um, and I'm there to say again. Maybe militia. Yeah, right? for sure, militia. If you're lucky, I mean, you could, you could have all kinds of crazies in, in some of these places. They're just they're not they're not organized, um, and 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 you know you have to come and you got to kind of try to understand what the problems they're having are, and if you can have if you can help solve them, then we do. So yeah, I've gone to some gnarly places for sure, but I'm fine. I've never had any kind of weird situation except for maybe once, and 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 even that one worked out. So yeah, th those are risks, but in the wow. end, I always come home with good stories. <laughs> well, it's a good thing you were in the Israeli army. So <laughs> that probably helped. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, so we have a question here. It asks, how much how much does the drone carry? How each drone carries about five pounds on each trip. But we really don't see that as a limitation because we can send hundreds of drones. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, how'd you come up with the name Zipline? I actually didn't come up with that name. It's, it's, it's actually not the best name, but I, I think it's because the the cable um, on the launcher kind of like reminded them of like the zipline, like you just let her rip. Yeah, like yeah. climbing in camp or something, <laughs> right? I, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I so. If you, and we'll, we'll steer away a little bit from Zipline per se, but if a young person, if any one of these people in the chat were to ask you right now, right, where you are in your life, um, and ask you, what do you think's the most important thing for living a good life? What would you say? For living a good life? Um, I mean, I think that it's really important to keep in mind one of the things that I've realized <clears throat> in my life that is that we're all such different people. And so, you know, measuring your own definition, having your own definition of success um, is very important and not letting other people's definition of success uh, matter. Uh, Kayla and I grew up in a community um, that had, you know, there was, there was, there was, there, there, there was certain, let's call it, um, the definition of success in that community is one that maybe I wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have made me as happy as I ended up, as I am in my life, um, because I sort of took a different direction. Um, in terms of, you know, I, I never pursued wealth. It wasn't something that was particularly interesting to me. I was really excited about exploring new countries, meeting new people, um, and, and, and that takes sort of like an open, worldly kind of perspective. Um, you know, I, I'm always really attracted to people who are different from me because it's an opportunity to expand my own horizons. And so that's my definition of happiness. It's possible that some of you, some of the, some of the people here listening, you know, would be very happy staying exactly where they are 
I think that the lesson that I would share is there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, the, the goal is really to figure out what it is that satisfies you. And, and not that I've got it all figured out. Um, I mean, I, I, I generally feel like a, like, a, like a kid with just less hair up here and more hair here. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, yeah, I, I feel like for now, as I'm still figuring things out, I think that's one of my main takeaways. Just try to figure out what satisfies you. And that's really all you need to be pursuing. Absolutely. I think that um, it's pursuing your passion, right? And I, and I know what you mean by that. With the when you, when you have that pressure to conform to what that definition of success is. And everybody's going to find it in their own way. So I would echo and that. It's um, such a trap, especially if you watch a lot of TV or on social media. You see all these people's fake lives on, on Facebook, Instagram, and what have you. And you can think, like, am I not as happy as them? As I, am I doing something wrong? They look like they're living this great life. And that is exactly the wrong way to look at it. I would exactly agree. the wrong way. To look at it. Agree. It's all about good people in your life. Mm -hmm. um, and and some of these kids probably saw DJ Herbert Haller the other day, which Yaniv also knows very well. We went, all went to school together. Um, and he said the same thing, you know, when you're on your deathbed one day, um, you're not. It's not going to be about the money or wanting to have another Benz or another BMW, but it's going to be, did I spend enough time with the people that I love and I care about, and did I have great experiences in my life? Um, and that's not I, even hypothetical. I feel like there's so many books that are written by people who just go talk to older people, go to old age homes, just ask them. You know what? Nobody ever says, "Oh, I wish I would have spent more time in the office. I really <laughs> wish I would have." I really wish I would have made even more money. Uh, you know, it, nobody says that. Everybody says the same thing. I wish I would have spent spent more time with my friends. I wish I would have, you know, surrounded myself with, um, you know, with with less negative people in my environment. I wish I would have taken, you know, spent more time with my kids. These are the kinds of things that people who are looking back are saying. I think it's a good idea to listen. Absolutely. So uh, Rylan has a quick question for us. Um, do the drones ever experience uh, AI problems or technical problems? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we've had problems for sure, um, you know, like certain things that we couldn't predict. Uh, like for, for a couple of weeks, we had the situation where as the drones were taking off from the launcher, um, you know, they were, they were just immediately launching their emergency parachute. We didn't know why. I mean, little things like that happened because we're inventing a new industry. But uh, we've, it's never gotten in the way of us, you know, accomplishing the mission and, and figuring out how to serve. And in each of those cases, we were able to solve it. It was a technical problem. Um, in that case, it was literally just static. Like the drone was getting confused because there was too much static because there was too much metal against metal. And so we just replaced one part and everything worked. So it's very iterative, it's very iterative. Oh, it's really important to set expectations with our, with our customers. Sorry, say again? I said that has to be really exciting to be part of something that is so innovative, right? Well, I'm, um, not, I'm watching from the sidelines. I'm not. I'm not solving any uh, any any stat just static problems with physics and engineering. I'm just watching in awe as my colleagues take care of it. Yeah, and I just wanted to show them really quickly. So, and I don't know if you want to just describe this really quickly. What that kind of I know we saw it in an image, but it kind this kind of um, or in a video, but this would probably showcase to them how it really works. Yeah, I hope this isn't too technical, but I can I can simplify this. Um, okay. So if you think about um, how a system right now works where you live, you've probably got you know a big hospital. That hospital is probably buying a bunch of medicine from somebody who makes that medicine, uh, and then, or maybe from somebody who's just selling that medicine. And the hospital's got to take that medicine, they've got to figure out where to send it. Um, and now if they send too much, it's the same problem that Amazon has. If they send too much, the medicine's going to go bad. You don't want that, because that's a waste of money. And that's why healthcare is so expensive. But if you don't send enough, then people could die. And so that's how the system works today. In the US and in Israel, where I'm from, they just send too much. And yeah, a lot of it goes in the garbage, but that's okay because it's worth it. Because if you need it, you want to know you have it. In a poor country, they don't they, they, they don't they can't afford that kind of waste. And so what they do is they undersend. And every month it happens that somebody shows up at the clinic and they don't have exactly what that person needs, and then they've got a tough situation. What we're doing here is if you look at the blood supply, that's where people are donating blood and they're testing it, essential medicines, things like anti-venom if you've gotten bitten by a snake, or vaccines if you want to make sure that people don't get an epidemic like we're having right now, or program drugs, which are actually like vaccines that are funded by, by uh, developed countries and donors. So what we're doing right now is we kind of make sure to take 
some of those things. In this example, in Rwanda, we actually deliver all the blood in the country. So all the blood goes directly to us and we send it only when it's needed. But with vaccines and essential medicines and program drugs, they still deliver it to, those, to, the, to, the, to the warehouses as they normally would, but some of them come to us. The reason we do that is because if they have some kind of an expectation of, you know, every day we're gonna use two antivenoms, for example, because it's a place with a lot of snakes, and there's no reason to use a drone for that. You can send a truck and the truck will have enough antivenom for those two people a day who are for sure gonna get bitten by a snake. But on a bad day, when a third person shows up or a fourth person shows up, that's where Zipline can really help because we can deliver it in 15, 20 minutes and they don't have to wait for the next truck delivery. So that's what this image is showing. It's kind of how the products flow through the system once we're there. Thank you for sharing that. And I, and I think that that's super cool because we don't think about that in our country, right? We have, we're so fortunate and we have so much. Um, but I think we're experiencing a bit of that right now and people are feeling a little panicked over that. We're not used to that, right? We're, well, we're I mean, I don't know. I mean, the situation in the U.S., if I think about it, the situation in the U.S. when it comes to public health care is very bad compared to all of these countries. I mean, it, 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 you know, bankruptcy from medical expenses is the number one reason people are homeless in the United States. When people in Sri Lanka hear that, they don't believe it because in Sri Lanka, all health care is free, obviously. I mean, it's the number one responsibility of the government to make sure that their people are at least healthy, right? uh, hopefully also educated and fed, but at least healthy. And so in countries like Sri Lanka, they really scratch their heads when they say you have homeless people because they got sick. That's crazy. So right. having such a expensive system also has its downsides. Absolutely. I would agree with you 100%. So Nicholas is asking, has Zipline ever thought to change into solar power? Yeah, great, great question. Actually, we do use solar power in, in some places to power our battery, to charge our batteries. So um, we don't have solar panels on the drone itself. We found that it's more efficient to have a solar field next to our distribution center to power the battery chargers. But there are some drones that actually have very large wingspans and they are completely solar powered. Now that, that technology is more appropriate for drones that have to be in the sky for a long time. Um, but our drones are only in the sky for about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, so we didn't think it was necessary. But yeah, solar power is a great way to get power in an area where you might not have a grid. That's a great question, Dale. Are all parts of the system reusable? And have you ever recycled um, drones? We'll, we'll combine those questions. So do we have um, are we using reusable and recyclable materials? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the drones are doing multiple flights, obviously. Every drone is doing many, many flights. Um, but, you know, because we're still early in the development of this industry, it's true that, you know, when, when, when one generation of drones um, gets replaced by another, we use what we can, but not everything gets reused. And that's okay, because we're still figuring it out. Part of what we're doing now that we're becoming a more mature company is trying to design our wings, for example, in a way that we'll probably be able to use those same wings even on future aircraft. The only real waste uh, in our entire system is that is that cardboard paper box and that little wax paper parachute, uh, because those are one time use. And the reason they're one time use is because we don't want to we don't have a way to bring them home. It's you know, it's complicated enough to get stuff out there. So to get a little you know paper box from the field back to our headquarters, the pain. And so we use recycled materials. Um, you know we try to make them as as light and environmentally friendly as possible. Um, but that is waste in our current system, and we're excited to find ways to solve that problem too. Um, but right now, that is the waste that we've tolerated so far. Why? Well, thank you so much. Um, as we wrap this up, so I have one last question for you, um, my friend. <laughs> um, if you think back, and and I, I've known you for a lifetime, uh, back to middle school or high school, and I think we kind of touched on this a little bit, but you know that feeling of um, awkwardness in those teenage years, trying to conform to the masses. Uh, it's intense, right? Um, and I don't think it's until you're older that you really embrace what it is that makes you unique. Um, so I ask you this, I even, and I ask DJ Herbert Holler this too. On a scale of one to 10, how weird are you? I mean, I think that Kenny Herbert Holler is probably the only guy in the school who was weirder than me. Um, but yeah, I was definitely super weird. And I had a weird name and I dressed weird because my mom was a farmer from Israel and she dressed me weird. And, uh, and, and I didn't know anybody's references on TV and I didn't get the jokes and it was really hard. Um, 
But if anything, I think it made me stronger. You know that song by Johnny Cash, A Boy Named Sue? Yeah. It's actually a shell song. I mean, throughout my childhood, I, I've thought a lot about that song. And, and even today, I think about it. I think that if you're really awkward and you're really weird and you're really you, chances are you're going to make it. Chances are you're being trained every day to figure out how to be you and how to be proud of who you are. And, um, and, 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 and th those, kinds of, those, those scars really uh, turn into muscle. And so I think it's, it's really been helpful. And so I think that's what that song, A Boy Named Sue, is all about, right? Yes, I, I would agree. And I, I, I agree with you. The, the weirdness, to me, weird's just a side effect of awesome, right? So it's what when you figure that out, you realize that your weirdness is your strength, right? And that's what's going to make right. you. Um, I mean, what? It was Coco Chanel, right? In order to be irreplaceable, one must be different. So um, you're... You're really, um, for all of you right now out there watching and you're struggling with that, that time that you're, that you're in, we've all been there. And every person that's gonna sit on one of these panels over the next two weeks, trust me, they didn't conform to the masses to be where they are now. That's my whole point. So um, you know, I thank you so much for being here today. Uh, John, I think you wanna wrap up some things. Um, sure thing. Yeah, uh, you need awesome, great, great learning about what your company is doing that you work with. Um, and honestly, the chat box, you know, has gotten some great questions about um, as soon as they started learning about the drone parts of it, like, honestly, like they just took off with the question. So um, very well, John, cool. If anybody has any other questions that, that I haven't answered or anything else, if you guys want to collect them and send them, I will go through them one by one. If anybody wants to talk to me on a phone call or a video chat mm -hmm. and ask me more about it. I am available. I'm excited to share. So yes, however sir. I can be helpful, okay? Yeah, for sure. So we'll share your information at the end on our last slide. Um, we do want to share though, uh, we, we are doing something called Flipgrid, which is kind of like TikTok for education. So for our students in Palm Beach County and um, our teachers in Palm Beach County, we would love to hear your thoughts on this, uh, this session. Uh, you could either take a, uh, a screenshot, a, a picture with this with your phone, or go to the link, which is also in the chat box. It's Flipgrid. If you've not used Flipgrid before, you just log in with your Google account. And once you're in there, make sure you're under the one that's titled Yani. It starts with Y-A-N because people are putting them in the wrong topics. Uh, so if you could get it in the right topic, that helps us out a lot. And uh, what we're going to do, though, is we're going to compile the responses that you share about this presentation, and we're going to share them with the Aniv as a mixtape so he can see all of your thoughts on this session. So, Thank um, you. yeah, so so please share some great thoughts and what you thought and questions, all that kind of fun stuff. For our teachers in the room, we do have some supplemental materials to go with the Aniv's talk. Um, it's on our website, which is the bit.ly slash PBC virtual experiences. And uh, there are three new Zella articles on drones, drone laws, drone warfares. Um, there's actually one, I believe, about the entire company as well on New Zella, which is pretty cool. Um, and we also have some clips from Discovery Education where they, one of the companies that work with Discovery, also did uh, uh, some stories on, on Zipline. So uh, they can actually, you guys can go in and watch those four sessions as well. Those are all on the website next to, uh, in this box next to uh, his name. So all of that is there for you. Teachers, just so you know, with those DE clips, there's also in DE when you search, there's a lesson plan that goes with it. Um, so they were definitely on the forefront of that. I was yeah. pleasantly surprised when I found the materials. Awesome. Um, and then one last thing before we close, tomorrow at 8 a.m. we are gonna be talking with the Norton Museum of Art. We're gonna be doing a dual language chat with them. So it's gonna be in English and Spanish. It'll be translated live while we're doing it. Um, so we'll switch between the two languages as we, uh, I believe we're gonna be looking at some Monet paintings. So that's gonna be fun. And then at 11.30, we're gonna talk to the Manatee Lagoon, which is over there on Singer Island, in that area of Palm Beach, um, to talk about the manatees that were, that's uh, the Manti Lagoon is partnered with FPL. FPL basically created that um, because all the manatees go there when they release all the hot water from the power plant. So the manatees need to come to some place where it's a little bit warmer sometimes during the year. 
Um, so with that, um, this is Yaniv's contact info. If you're interested in reaching out to him, students and teachers to want to know more. Um, and with that, uh, I will I will give Kaylin and Yaniv the last word. Well, um, I'll thank you, Yaniv, for, for coming. And I, I appreciate you. Um, it's been a long time since I've seen you in the flat. <laughs> But it was wonderful to see you virtually. Um, you're doing amazing work, and I thank you for inspiring the kids today. Um, and keep doing awesome work. And I'll let the last word be from you. I mean, I, I feel like I have to thank you. Now that I'm a, a home a homeschooling dad, I, I finally appreciate just how hard teachers work. And uh, and so I, I I appreciate you, and I and I thank you, and thanks everybody for all your great questions and for your interest in what we're doing. And uh, please stay in touch and follow us. And if you have any questions, we're, we're here and we're happy to chat. Absolutely. Thank you so much for everybody attending today. Bye now.